Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, uh, so we are in the process of discussing the pathways downstream of an activated receptor tyrosine kinase, and we're in the process of looking at the MAP kinase ERK pathway. Okay, now I'll just remind you where we've got to so far. We started off with this protein GRB2, which stands for Growth Factor Receptor Binding Protein 2, which has an SH2 domain. This SH2 domain will bind to phosphotyrosine residues on the cytoplasmic tails of these receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, then the GRB2 also has another important domain known as the SH3 domain for SARC homology domain 3. Okay, and uh, this is capable of binding to an area rich in proline residues. Okay, and it will bind to a proline rich region in the SOS protein, which stands for Son of Sevenths. Okay, so uh, what then will happen is this SOS protein will become activated and it will act as a RAS GEF. Okay, so it's going to activate RAS monomeric G proteins by catalyzing the exchange of guanosine diphosphate for guanosine triphosphate that is bound to these RAS proteins. Now I told you that there are four different types of RAS protein, BRAS, NRAS, and KRAS4A, KRAS4B. Now, um, B KRAS4A and KRAS4B are the two separate splice variants of a single gene, okay, the KRAS gene. Uh, so that gene can produce two different proteins, uh, the two different splice variants, which come about by splicing the mRNA in different ways. And these are KRAS4A and KRAS4B. Now, as far as we're concerned, all four of these RAS monomeric G proteins do the same thing, okay? So we're not going to distinguish which of these uh, for it is, and we're going to keep it nice and general and just have RAS written there. Okay, right. So we now want to look at what the RAS monomeric G protein is actually going to activate now that it's in the on state. Okay, so it is going to activate something known as the MAP kinase module. Okay, so it's going to activate a cascade of kinases, and the fancy name for this uh, kinase cascade is to call it a MAP kinase module. Okay, right. So firstly, what does MAP stand for? And we'll be seeing this later when we actually discuss MAP kinase itself. MAP stands for mitogen activated protein. Okay, so in full, this is the mitogen activated protein kinase module. So the M is for mitogen. A mitogen is just uh, any molecule that is capable of making a cell divide. So it's a mitosis promoting agent, basically. Okay, uh, then uh, the A is activated or associated, whichever you prefer, mitogen associated or mitogen activated. Okay, and we'll have a little dash there. And then the P is for protein. So MAP stands for mitogen activated protein, and we're going to see the enzyme, the key enzyme within this MAP kinase module is going to be the MAP kinase enzyme itself, which we'll come to later. So the name for the entire cascade of kinases that we're about to study is the MAP kinase module. Okay, so this is the name for the entire cascade from now on. Okay, so what then is the first enzyme in the MAP kinase module. Well, the first enzyme is going to be an enzyme known as RAF. Okay, so I'll put this here. Now, there are different types of RAF enzymes, just like there are different types of RAS proteins. Okay, and I'll tell you about the different types uh, in a moment. So, we'll colour in our RAF enzyme in green here. Okay, and it's going to be, once activated, a serine threonine kinase which I'll explain in a moment. Okay, so let's start with the different forms of RAF, RAF enzymes. Okay, so there are three different forms of RAF enzymes. There is something known as ARAF, okay? There is then also BRAF, and finally there is CRAF as well. Okay, now CRAF has another name. CRAF is also called RAF1, okay? Whoops, not like that. 
RAF1. Now, all three of these RAF kinase enzymes uh, all do pretty much the same thing, which is that they phosphorylate the next enzyme along. So, again, we will uh, just call our protein here a RAF protein, and when I write that, what that means is it's one of these three, but I don't really care which it is. Okay, uh, so those are the three RAF enzymes. Now, at the moment, the RAF enzyme is inactive, okay? And when it's inactive, it's in the cytoplasm, okay? In addition, when it's inactive, it has phosphate groups of certain residues. So I'll show these here. So it has phosphate groups attached to certain residues, and these phosphate groups on these phosphorylation sites um, bind... Uh, well, mean that this RAF protein can bind to another protein, okay? So in the inactive state, the RAF kinase enzyme has phosphate groups on certain residues, and these phosphate groups being on these special inhibitory residues here are going to allow another protein to associate here, okay? And this protein is called 1433, okay? And this is a protein we're going to see again later. Okay, when we come on to talk about the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. So, at the moment, when the RAF enzyme is inactive, it's in the cytoplasm, it has these phosphate groups uh, attached to inhibitory phosphorylation sites. And the reason they inhibit it is they allow this other protein to come and bind. Okay, and this is an inhibitory protein 1433 here. Okay, right. So... What's then now going to happen is once you've got RAS in the on state, what can happen is the RAF protein can come up here and bind to the RAS protein. Okay, now I'll get another piece of paper and show this happening. Okay, now the RAS protein binding to uh, the RAF kinase enzyme is not directly going to activate the RAF kinase enzyme, but it's going to localize it underneath the phospholipid bilayer. So, here is the phospholipid bi there. Here's this lipid moiety which attaches uh, the monomeric um, RAS G protein to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bi there. Okay, so here is our RAS protein. It's now in the on state, and when RAS is in the on state, it can bind to the RAF enzyme. So, we'll have our RAF enzyme here. Okay, and that can be any one of those three different RAF enzymes that we've talked about, A RAF, B RAF, or C RAF. Okay, so let's colour this in. We'll colour in our RAS monomeric G protein here, in orange. Okay, and now, now that it's in the on state, so I will highlight the GTP here, we can now bind this RAF uh, kinase enzyme, which was previously in the cytoplasm. Now, the RAF kinase enzyme is still inactive, okay? It still has these phosphate groups attached to uh, inhibitory um, phosphorylation sites, and it has multiple of these. I'm drawing two of them uh, just to get the message across that it's got multiple, but two isn't the correct number. It's got more than that, okay? I think it's something like the RAF kinase enzymes in total have around 13 known phosphorylation sites. Some of them are activatory, some of them are inhibitory, okay, but there are more than two inhibitory phosphorylation sites on RAF, okay, so I'm just putting two there to make you realise that there's multiple of these, not just one, okay, but two isn't the right number, okay, right, so, um, these phosphate groups attached to these inhibitory phosphate phosphorylation sites have allowed this protein 1433 to associate with the RAF kinase, and that's still there. Now, once um, you have recruited the RAF kinase enzyme to the uh, RAS protein, what can now happen is an enzyme can come and chop these phosphate groups off the inhibitory phosphorylation sites, which will mean that the 1433 proteins uh, will fall off, basically. Okay, now the protein that is believed to do this is protein phosphatase 2A. Okay, so I'll draw this here. So this is an enzyme which is going to remove uh, phosphate groups from proteins. Okay, called PP2A. And this stands for, the first P is for protein, the second P is then for phosphatase, which just means uh, an enzyme that can remove phosphate groups from things, and then 2A. 
Okay, so we'll have uh, protein phosphatase 2A in purple here, and it's going to remove phosphate groups from those inhibitory phosphorylation sites on the RAF kinase enzyme. Now, the removal of those inhibitory phosphate groups is going to mean that the 14 free free enzyme cleaves away from the RAF kinase enzyme. Okay, now that's not the only step in the activation of RAF kinases. You don't just remove the inhibitory phosphate groups and now it's active. It's more complicated than that. The activation of RAF kinase enzymes is very, very complicated. Okay, um, what now happens is it's going to get phosphorylated on activatory phosphorylation sites. So let's say we've got an activatory phosphorylation site over here. Okay. So let's have one of these. And this is going to be uh, on tyrosine residues specifically. We're going to phosphorylate tyrosine residues. Okay, and again, there's multiple of these, but I'll just show one of them. Okay, right. And the enzyme that's very involved in adding phosphate groups onto tyrosine residues, uh, which are activatory phosphorylation sites, is a SARC tyrosine kinase. Okay, so the tyrosine kinase enzyme after which all of these domains, the SH3 domain and the SH2 domain, are named. Okay, uh, so it's not a receptor tyrosine kinase SARC. It's a free tyrosine kinase enzyme which is within the cytoplasm. Okay, so here it is, and it's going to phosphorylate tyrosine residues on the uh, RAF kinase. Okay, so what is going to happen then overall? the um, protein phosphatase 2A is going to come and remove the inhibitory phosphate groups once the RAF kinase enzyme has bound to the RAS protein. Okay, that will result in the removal of the 14 free free protein. Then, after that, what can now happen is a SARC family tyrosine kinase enzyme can come and phosphorylate separate phosphorylation sites on the RAF kinase, and this will activate it.